<clears throat> Welcome everybody to uh, our special seminar. Um, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Jana. He's coming from uh, South Dakota State University in the U.S. And uh, Jana has been working with, uh, with Daniel Mogo on the Bolag Fellowship uh, that uh, we participate in as a CG Center. So Daniel was named Jana uh, last year upon approval of the project. And he spent almost six months in the US uh, working with Jana on some work uh, that Jana is going to talk about in his introduction. Some exciting work coming out of there. Uh, today, Jana is going to explore some of the potential collaborative opportunities that exist between uh, his research program and, and our research program in SIP beyond OFSP uh, and puree and bread. So I would like to introduce you to Jana and I want to invite you to listen carefully and participate actively and uh, please um, have questions and feel free to share those questions uh, after the presentation. I look forward to an interactive session. And, uh, over to you, Jana. Thank you. Thank you. You have to stand here. Can you get it? Good afternoon. Thank you for the nice introduction, Tawanda. It's a pleasure to come back. Uh, during Last year, during December, I came here. <coughs> Frankly, I was really impressed the greenery, and I really enjoy coming back here. And hopefully, there will be some more trips in the near future. Uh, currently, I'm a faculty member at the Department of Dairy and Food Science, South Dakota State University. I'm a food chemist. I focus on carbohydrates, starches, and polysaccharides. I'm very much interested in developing functional foods or food supplements by encapsulating bioactive compounds, anything that is health promoting and disease preventing. I would like to add those carbohydrate matrices and come up with novel functional foods and medicinal foods or food supplements. We also use these biopolymers for treating water. For example, we are trying to capture those nitrates and phosphates or even ammonia from water and then so that we could <coughs> clean water that comes out, especially from the runoff. And then hopefully, once we take off those uh, uh, nutrients, we don't have to call them as contaminants. I mean, depending on the audience we are speaking at, we could call them as nutrients. They could be reused as a fertilizer. That is one of our emphasis. And also, more recently, I mean, it's very, very late, I could say, we also started exploring developing novel packaging films, especially using the cellulose, Predominantly from the agriculture residues, the bio <coughs> biomasses. And then some of these ideas I would like to share with you all and then see where we all could do together. As we all know, plastic is a medical material. It solves so many of our problems. Listen, we could develop products in food, water production, clothing, medicine, transportation, electronics, household goods, anything. A sky is the limit for the plastics, mainly because all that we would develop products that are strong, flexible, and also the expense that is needed them is very low, so low cost material. So thus, since the innovation in 1950s, there is a dramatic expansion of products based on plastics. We really saw a lot of, for example, see this, uh, even this, what do you call it, this uh, transform. Is there more? So the yeah, pointer. It's yeah. also made up of plastic. Anything. We cannot imagine uh, any product without plastic. Even computers. Think, I mean, maybe even here there is some plastic. So, as you see, a lot of this, it appears there is around 400 million tons of plastics are being produced every year. The food, around 36% goes to the packaging, predominantly for the food. And then building and construction, 16%, and then 10% to the Institute for Products, and textiles, 
electronics, 4%. So it looks like majority of them is going to the, the packaging, that's really good. So in a way, believe me, in, when you use this food, indirectly it may enter to, it enters our food system and ultimately it reaches us. And after we use all these plastics, where do you think, what do you think is going to happen to them? We just dump them in the soil, thinking that it will, it will be biodegradable, soil would absorb, but unfortunately it doesn't happen. It takes more than 1,000 uh, 1, years for them to get completely de degraded. And then meanwhile, till then, it is going to be a big waste, and then that's going to be a big issue. That's what the world is facing now. And predominantly, we have two types of plastic categories. You could categorize them as well. thermoplastics or thermosets. The thermoplastics, I mean, all this, this you could do polyesterine, serine, polypropylene, and all those things. Here, the property here is when you heat them, they melt, and then when you cool them, they solidify. So this is how it, they allow us to get a wide variety of products. On the other hand, the thermo says they undergo a chemical reaction when you heat them and then they are reversible, but still they do not offer service to us. Especially polyethylene, we use them in uh, household construction, especially as a sealant, we use that. Based on this, come up some of the products that let show, because we use this uh, low density P to prepare bags, trays, containers, food packaging films, <coughs> even microwave dishes, ice cream tubes, but everything based on the plastics. So this, and over the years, all our uh, containers, everything have been slowly replaced by plastic. For example, you see, good old days we used to use glass, glass and metal to carry milk, but now we have pouches, plastic pouches, plastic bags. I think some of you might remember the toothpaste in a metal container, but nowadays we use plastic. So, like this, the sacks and everything you can imagine, everything has been replaced with plastic because, as I said in the beginning, mm -hmm. you could use strong material and low in cost and then flexible, easy to produce. So, this is something definitely in some concepts which I'll show you in a minute. If you look at the base that has been generated over the years, all this in 2015, we have generated around 300 million tons of plastic. So it does dump in the soil, it doesn't get degraded, it's all getting accumulated. Where do you think all this is going to get accumulated? Mostly in the ocean. Ocean. So that is going to be a big problem for the marine organisms. And see, we make the product. And then we think that it could be recycled, but it doesn't happen. Maybe, maybe around less than 10% gets recycled, and then some we could bond them. But predominantly, the majority of them is landfill, dump, or liquor. So that's around 80% of the plastic is still there. It's going to be a big problem. This needs to be addressed. The impact, if you see, on the environment is huge. And mainly because the plastic, if you look at uh, the lightweight material, and then you use and then throw, and then it could fly, fly because it's very light. So we could carry it. So ultimately, if it go and settle in the ocean or somewhere else, and then as I said, and then it takes thousands of years for it to get. And meanwhile, it could release some microparticles, plastic particles, that could end up in our food system. And then go. And meanwhile, the marine organisms, they start in death. They, they cannot digest them, but they swallow and then ultimately they get. They die. And also some of this, uh, because thinking that there is food, they consume and then they die. And then some of these marine organisms, they could get entangled in this and then eventually they die in starvation. So we are putting all this uh, in the endangered. And, and, the and then it might eventually come back to humans as well. And it looks like, as, as I said here, around 4 million to 12 million metric tons of plastic is being dumped in every year. Starting to be insane. We have been doing it. But one more funny thing here is, it looks like we are, we are producing 1 to 5 trillion plastic bags 
I'm talking about only facts. Facts. And then, we're producing about 10 million plastic bags in a, every minute. That is in a way justified because you see now we have around 7.1 billion people throughout the globe. We have feed the food we, that is produced in some part of the world and then that <coughs> is transported. The plastic comes in handy to wrap the food and then transport it. It's very easy. But now soon, by 2030, we are going to have 9 billion people. We have to feed them all. Give the chance nutritious food. But at least to feed them, the bags would be really helpful. But unfortunately, unfortunately, just because they're not biodegradable, they end up as a waste and then that is going to be the problem. And one more interesting thing is if we could put those past 10 million plastic bags one next to each other, we could wrap the entire globe seven times. And then we could even cover the size of a France. So that much of the plastic we are producing every day. Can we show you Oh, oh no, no, I don't have the UR. Sorry. Okay, I would like to visit this three uh, later. I mean, I have around nine minutes videos, but they are not recorded here. I mean, give the chance to get them. These are these are all very recent ones. For example, more recent study. This came in March 2018. Shows that all the plastic bottles that we drink the water that is invariably has some micro particles that you cannot, we cannot see through our visual eyes, but there are every water that we get. This was, uh, I think, studied all over the, they took bottles all over the world from different companies, and then they found out that every water is contaminated with the micro particles. So, in a way, we are consuming that. And also, this one that shows about uh, uh, our marine organisms consuming the plastic, thinking that it is. Food, and then some people are trying to rescue them so that so and also for all these years China has been importing a lot of this plastic they try to recycle and then try to come up with some new products based on it but however I think around 45 percent of plastic is being imported to China but however, since January 2018 onwards, they decided not to import anymore. So it is going to be a big problem for all of us because whoever is trying to ship the plastic waste to China and then they are in a big one off. So that is a big problem that needs to be addressed very immediately. And consequently, many because of this, to address this uh, plastic waste, every government, every country, they are taking it seriously and then they are coming up with different solutions. And then, for example, here in the Vietnam, they said they are trying to control the waste, plastic waste. Even Kenya, I think last year they started this. India and many countries now that are banning the plastic usage. And even in states, I see different, uh, if every state has their own regulations and then they are trying to impose the condition, restrictions and all those things. This is really good. So now we have realized the problem of plastic. And then we are trying to ban it. But we have reached a stage where we cannot live without plastic. So, what are the alternatives for us? Are there any? And also, this is the plastic is also putting a lot of pressure on the food companies. For example, with McDonald's now, they are trying to move to from plastic straws to paper straws. But it looks like initially they are going to implement one in the UK because that's where. All the consumers have demanded, but hopefully soon they will go to other countries as well. And some of the uses that really putting a lot of pressure on companies like Nestle, Pepsi, and other, which to move from plastic. So this is major movement we drive for this. So what are our alternative sources? Because okay, now we identify the problems of plastic. We wanted to move away, but is there anything that we could do? That's where the biomass comes into handy. The biomass, because we produce at least 150 billion metric tons of biomass every year. Predominantly, it comes from agriculture, forestry, manufacturing, and then plant and animal waste. Quite various of sources we could get for biomass. 
and all that is being wasted now because it's dumped and then it slowly gets biodegraded. So if you could, out of this 150 billion metric tons per year, if you could take a fraction of it and then convert it to useful material, hopefully we'll be able to solve the plastic issues. So that's what goal is one of my goals. And here the statistics are based in the US because I'm I'm from US. But unfortunately, I don't have any statistics from this uh, region. Here, in 2001, we produced around 205 million dry tons of crop residues. I'm focusing only on crop, not the entire biomass. Crop residues, which could be corn store, wheat straw, soybean straw, grass, anything. And then now, they're projecting by 2030, we could reach around 320 million dry tons. So, this all this is now, which some of them could go as a coffee, animal feed, and then majority of them being dumped in the soil because it's biodegraded and all those things. But this biomass, the crop residues are rich in cellulose. So if you could extract the cellulose, that could be really <coughs> useful. That could solve what the plastic concerns that the world is facing now. So at this moment, we use the cellulose for the chase, tables, and all those things. And then recently I was uh, awarded one year fellowship project from uh, Sun, uh, Sun Grand Central. So there we are trying to use corn store, extract cellulose from corn store. As you see, the corn store, we have the stars, leaves, tussle, husk, cob, everything about the ground, excepting the grains. Okay? If you look at is around 45 percent cellulose, 30 percent ME cellulose, and then 25 percent ME. So, if you could extract this 45 percent cellulose from this construct, this construct alone, you will have huge amount of cellulose to handle. And apart from that, there are other sources. For example, here, SIP has been focusing on sweet potato. Recently, through Barla Fellowship, Daniel came to the group, and then we tried to develop it. Bread, I know here a lot of emphasis has been done. But so now the SIP is focusing I mean, on coming up with new products based on that, one that goes out of the ground. But water is above the ground, I think that is being discarded now. Someone is being used as an animal feed and rest goes the waste. So, but all that is rich in source of cellulose for us. So, we have to develop a protocol and then get the cellulose. So if we could do that, we'll be using the whole, whole, whole plant, zero waste. So we could use this as a nutrition product, and also here we could come up with some plastic alternatives. This is one potential opportunity we could pursue <coughs> to the plant. And also one more opportunity I see is cassava. Cassava is being used, cassava starts, cassava first. You can see the cassava plant. This is also rich in cellulose, but it's being listed now. It's not being explored much. Similarly, one can think of using potato and sugar cane. Well, you could use that. And then bananas too. I really like because we use only this material and this soil. So this is also rich source of cellulose. So these are some of the things that we could explore apart from the corn store. And other sources of cellulose, as we all know, we could use cotton, hemp, flax, seed, jute, or wood. These are some of the sources. So, I, have, I mean, I was telling, I'm telling you all that we could extract cellulose from this biomass and then use them as the alternative for the plastic. That's really good. Is it that easy to find with you? It's not that simple because cellulose is not water solid. Let us try to look at this much. The chemical structure, if you look at it, it is a beta D glucose. And beta D glucose leads to one core linkage. And then it's the beta, if it is alpha, that becomes starch, you and I could digest because that's our energy source. But when the beta conformation changes to alpha, sorry, uh, alpha changes to beta, that becomes like a structural polystyrene by milky. And this is what insoluble. If you look at the structure and packing arrangement, this is how they looks like. 
See, the broken lines are the broken lines are hydrogen bonds, and this forms a sheet like structures. And then within the sheet, we have strong hydrogen bonds, and then between the sheets also we have strong hydrogen bonds. Then you might be wondering, how oh, could just fill this space into one foot penetrate? It doesn't happen in cellulose because the intersheet separation is around 3.9 angstroms. At 3.9 angstroms, water can never penetrate. What has to penetrate means we need at least 5 to 5.2 angstrom space, then only water molecule could penetrate and make hydrogen bonds. At 3.9 angstroms, it's impossible to make. So thus, the network is highly rigid, very strong, and then gives the water in solid. So if you want to make it a soluble, if you want to soluble cellulose, all the trick here is to make this hydrogen, break these hydrogen bonds. Hopefully we'll be able to. <coughs> and for the last 100, 150 years, we <coughs> have been exploring different approaches, ecologies to solubilize cellulose. They use lithium chloride on other things, ammonia, ammonia, salt, phosphoric acid, quite not. But unfortunately, these are toxic. You know, in fact, the solubility also is not complete. 100% we will not get it. We need elevated temperatures that causes sort of cost, and then we cannot recycle them. Really, we can even ionic liquids are one more <coughs> uh, handy ones that could help us to solubilize the cellulose. Why very surprised ionic solvents are available, but the production costs are very high, and they are sensitive to moisture, and thus there is a limitation. Think of using sodium hydroxide, urea, thiourea, very good to solubilize. But high toxicity, and we cannot require all the solvent, there will be something left in the system. So, especially when you are trying to develop something that could live, there is limitations, and then there could be some type of side effects. In this line, what we did was we used inorganic salts, for example, zinc chloride. We use zinc chloride. And we, got, we showed that we used uh, a, a cellulose, a vessel, microcrystal cellulose. And then we showed that zinc chloride will help us to solubilize the uh, cellulose. And the most interesting thing here is once it's solubilized, whatever you want, you could do it and then recover back the zinc chloride. So thus, we have a recyclable one, non toxic because all the salt has put the reboot and it is inexpensive. Environment friendly. So we have, we could probably say that we have a green protocol because whatever the chemical we're using, nothing is left. We could be able to solubilize it. And also, in our research, we found out that after we solubilize the cellulose, we could add some calcium chloride, right? we could further build a network among those sol solubilized cellulose chains. So this is what is really happens. The cellulose has a sheet like structure. In sheet like structure, we have this O3, O5 hydrogen bond and then O2, O6 hydrogen bond. Sometimes this could be absent, but all the time in the case of cellulose, this O3, O5 hydrogen bond is present. So if you could break this hydrogen bond, boom, we could solubilize the cellulose. This is what the uh, bacteria does. The xanthan gum, what really happens is xanthan also cellulose like backbone, but bacteria and every disaccharide dis here it substitutes three sugar units. Consequently, this hydrogen bond is broken and then xanthan is water soluble. So same thing we also could do. It's not that easy to chemically substitute. But we, what we did was we used zinc chloride. The zinc ion nicely goes to hydrogen bonds with this both ion and consequently this bond is broken and then everything gets super solubilized. First of all. And later when you add calcium ions, we found out that we could even increase the gelation. So this is the elastic, this is the last modulus, this elastic modulus. So whenever the elastic modulus is more than the last modulus, we could say that it's in gel state. These are the viscoelastic properties. So this is in the case of zinc ions. Once you add calcium ions, we found out that elastic modulus is greater than the last modulus. So that shows that mm -hmm. there is some gelation could be induced. And we made film space like that. We found out that in the presence of calcium ions, you could nicely create those nanofibers. 
in the films. And those, because of the nanofibers, the films are very tough. See, for the cancer stem, this is zinc cellulose, and then this, so when you introduce calcium, the cancer stem increases by around 300 to 400 times. You see, here my colleague is holding a number, it's around 100 pounds, and we could even hold more than that. So here is a very small thing here. And this is zinc cellulose, and when you add calcium, we could even make transfer films. So this gives us a viable opportunity to develop novel cellulose based films by using a very efficient technology. So this is where I see some prospect opportunities for all of us because we know that plastics and byproducts by products that are contributing a lot of health problems to humans and animals. And as we all know, plastic pollution is slow, silent, omnipresent, and it's increasing. But this is where we believe that cellulose from abundant sources, here I'm using corn starch, but it could be from any biomass. These are all low value because at this moment we are trying to discard them. Could be a potential alternative to combat the current and future plastic concerns. Once we develop some films, these are some of the applications that I'm thinking. We could use them to come up with novel crops to hold the food material, the yogurts, the wrap the vegetables, even water. I'm very much interested in water because we're trying to clean the water, and then if you could pack the water in the cups that made biodegradable material. And hopefully, we'll be able to give us very good, uh, I mean, good water for humans because at this moment, all the plastic bottles that we are drinking, invariably, there will be some contamination. And she's my student, Eliza. She's focusing on, she's trying to develop starch and poly uh, polysaccharides. She's in, using to develop edible films. In those lines, we could even use cellulose and then look at the combinations of other materials and come up with edible packaging with the edible films or packaging. That is one more area I would like to explore. Hopefully, our synergistic efforts will eventually help us to the current and future generation to arrive with the sobering consequence of all plastics. That's what I'm doing. So that's all I have, and then I thank. All this is made possible because of the Borla Fellowship, and that is how I came to never sit, and then all the interesting research that is going on on sweet potato. Uh, well, thanks for the SIP and also Kawanda <coughs> and then Daniel for giving me an opportunity to work with Sweet Potato. We'll definitely continue on it, but now I see a potential opportunity to go beyond Sweet Potato. That's where we could come up with the novel bio based packaging films. And also, I would like to thank It's Not Simple, Sometimes Simple for sponsoring one year project and then my hatch. That's all I have, and then I'll be happy to take your comments and then questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, it's time to discuss. Uh, please feel free to ask any question about the presentation. I just started this. I don't have many results to share with you, so that's why I'm sharing the concept. So feel free to pitch in your ideas. And yeah, let's go. Can you explain a bit the, how quickly it degrades cellulose-based packets? I think two, three months to be frank with you. I, I have not done it by the, my, myself, but somewhere I read that. For but example, depending on the way you process, you make the film, I think it takes anywhere between two to three months. Can you manipulate that? Can you make some... 100 years, other two days. Sure, sure. I mean, that, that, that is one of my focuses too. For the industrial people. Yeah. Yes, want. yes, that is one of my focuses too. <clears throat> I think we could do it, but don't ask me what is it we have to do, because I don't know. But I think it is the open. So we have to do it too, right? It's two, three months, uh, stability won't be sufficient, especially if you want to use it. Uh, in food applications, we need long-term stability. The, con the container that we are using should be stable. Can you do enzymatic degradation of the cellulose and the, and the biofilms made from the cellulose? Where do you want to use enzymes? 
do it in the soil and then the bacteria take it. Just the So you, you can just dump it in the ground and then it will degrade. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do any enzymes unless you want to. Okay. And you can make synthetic cellulose. You don't need to extract it from biomass. Abundant. Yeah, well, so it's there. Why do you want to make synthetic cellulose? That defeats the purpose can, of. Uh, you probably control different structures of cellulose with different properties and different uh, degradation. Might be also less expensive. I don't know. I'm just asking. It's a question. Huh? I'm Idea is good, mm -hmm. but at this moment, I think it's better we focus on the natural. System. Mother Nature has given us abundant resources. Why can't we exploit that? So once again, reinventing the wheel in the lab and creating, no doubt, if you could do that, you'll have a lot of control, especially when you're trying to develop product, reproducible, and all those things be very easy once you have a control on the DP, chain link, and all those things. Okay. Natural resources, we have those very variations, and that could be some, there could be some challenges. But otherwise, personally, I like to use whatever is available in nature, so that we don't have to. There must be big companies working on that, no? Yeah, people have been focusing it. I am not the one who started this. Cellular solubility for last 150 years, people are working. And for last 20, 30 years, people are using uh, biomass to extract cellulose. But they extracted cellulose and then they left it there. People have not moved forward because so far there is a limitation on the cellulose solubility and then people are using all the toxic chemicals. But in 2016, we proved that we could use this inorganic solute, zinc chloride, so soluble cellulose and make films and then remove all the of zinc chloride. That's what we showed that. So that opens up it personally a, a window of opportunities for us to explore. And that is what I would like to do because now is, I will extract cellulose. Now I know how to make films, and hopefully we'll come up with uh, some end products. We can use some entrepreneurs like. Uh, I'll turn you. Sorry, I'm really sorry. I know it starts with yeah, and then I forgot. And we could do some of the products that we are interested. So at this moment, I'm focusing on films, but I want to go beyond that. So in terms of the crops, which ones tend to have higher cellulose compared like potatoes, sweet potato, the the biomass? Do you have an idea like which crops will give you a higher yield? I think corn stock will give us good uh, higher yield compared okay. to Iran. And then I think the next is uh, wheat straw and then soybean also. And then this uh, sugar cane pulp also has good cellulose. And as far as the sweet potato pea, uh, sweet potatoes and potatoes, I don't know. Okay. One has to explore those things. Or maybe somebody has done it. I don't do the literature. But I have not done it by myself. Okay. So, but you said like in, in corn, the is it thirty seven percent cellulose and hemicellulose and forty five percent. Forty five percent. Gotcha. So so can we take the lignins and the pectins sure. and also use them as byproducts sure. to purify and yeah. with their functional ingredients? Right? Yes, yes. But I'm focusing on cellular mainly because now I know how to solidify cellulose and come up with a product. And if you ask me how could you handle lignin, at yeah. this moment I don't have a clue, that's why I'm silent about it. Okay. I'm saying I'm discarding those two. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we have to. For example, that hemicellulose is highly water soluble and then we could make nice beverages. Yeah. It works as a dietary fiber. Yeah. Yeah. People have been exploring corn and xylan for a long time. Yeah. But I discarded Nicely because I'm focusing on silver. On the silver, yeah. But as you rightly said, we could use lignin and then come up with a product. Yeah. And with cellulose, you could develop some good applications. Yeah. So nothing goes waste. Yeah. It's, it's a fractionation step where you have byproducts that have emission value. Like zero waste system where everything is going to somewhere. Zero you know, waste system as long as you know what you want to do it. Yeah. And if you could fractionate them and then depending on the product of your interest. To develop something, but for this project, I'm focusing on silvers. Maybe tomorrow I'll come up with the like and make a heavy silvers. I 
I sincerely believe it will be very easy, very easy because there have been some solutions can be prepared, but we haven't had done various schedule from the beginning and have to schedule for very well. But I believe it is feasible, and it could be easily recycled too. There should not be any problem. But one has to explore this. So I would ask, what is the big challenge for you right now in this research? Uh, I said I'm a solubilized cellulose, but at the same time, making a product is not that easy. And also, uh, taking out all the zinc chloride from the system also it takes a lot of washings, and then we had to use like ethanol we are using, and then. That adds up some cost. Antonio will not like it when one says they cost. So that is one thing we want to replace. And then so that we could save some dollars. And then, as you said, we have to look at the uh, cellulose from different sources. Yes, they have different lengths, different properties, different solubilities. And that ultimately is going to affect the film properties. For example, if I look at the film. Uh, or if you look at other products, that will impact. So somebody has to prove that. Somebody says, do it in a proof. Let us say, cellulose from uh, sugar cane straw and its corn straw mm -hmm. and then sweet potato wines. They are not going to be same. So that's one thing we need to prove. In order for us to have a application that we are, whatever I am thinking about, that research needs to be done. You have people online? Uh, no questions? No. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, uh, let's give uh, Dr. Jana another hand of <laughs> And uh, I'd like to thank you for this uh, different approach to agriculture, which is not in the realm of our work right now, but I think, as you clearly pointed, um, pollution of the environment is a major concern. And the way we produce food, the way we use food, and the way we manage the waste products is, is now part of the ecosystem. And we are now being asked in our proposals, what is your environmental management policy? It has to be clearly outlined. So, I mean, if we start to see how we can um, work on our waste from potato harvesting, uh, potato waste that is not marketable, sweet potato that has been damaged by weevils, that's not good for consumption, the vines, uh, waste like in West Africa, people don't eat the Forage or the leaves, you see people dumping leaves everywhere. So we can come up with ideas on how to come up with a, a sustainable way to use these these products uh, to generate income for people and also to clean the environment. We can, we can add value. Yes, we can right. generate more money, more jobs. Yes. yes. More companies. More companies. Yes. So Dr. Jana also works on starch. So if you have interest in starch, um, you can talk to him about that. We deliberately didn't uh, ask him to talk about the research they did with Daniel, uh, but there's some exciting uh, results coming out of that work. If you want to learn more about the work that Daniel did with China, they are here. Feel free to talk about that. But we wanted to open this space to new ideas that uh, for us to think about how to collaborate with, with Jana in this program, and come up with some proposal, uh, concept not more exchange visits, more volunteer fellowships, or other private sector funding. So, so, so we could do a lot to pursue these ideas. Anything related Thank to you. biopolymers? I was, I'm, I'm there. Yes. Thank you. Polysaccharides and starch. Yes. I'm interested. Biopolymers. I'm interested. Feel free to write to me. <laughs>